Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to the international premiere of Christy Hall's film, Daddy-O. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the CEO here at TIFF. I'm glad to see all of you here. Um, I wanted to begin by um, thanking some of the people and the organizations who make everything we do possible at TIFF. I want to begin with our own members and our donors, maybe some of you, any member or donor in the room. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Um, also thanks to our lead sponsor, Bell, and our major sponsors, RBC, Bulgari, and Visa, and our major public supporters, the uh, Government of Ontario, Telefilm Canada, and the City of Toronto. Um, a reminder, it's only day four, so maybe reminders are still helpful. People's Choice Award, you vote for it. Please don't forget to vote. You go online to tiff.net slash vote to vote for the films of your choice. We want to thank WME Independent and CAA Media Finance uh, for providing us with this film. And I'm excited about this film because I saw it fairly late in the process of our selection, and it was a film that I knew would provoke conversation, and I like those kind of movies, uh, and I hope you do too. This is from Christy Hall, who is a writer-director based in New York. She co-created, produced, and wrote the TV series, I'm Not Okay With This. People know that series, some of you, yes? Yeah. All right, good. Um, and the reason I think it provokes conversation is because you know, every movie uh, generates a response based on what you bring in to the experience of watching it, but I think the more intimate the movie, uh, the more it depends on what you bring into it, your own life experience, your own thoughts, opinions, feelings. And this is one of those movies. It's an intimate movie. It is a two-hander uh, with two of the great screen actors that we have working right now, Dakota Johnson and Sean Penn, uh, written and directed by Christy, shot by a great cinematographer, Faden Papamichael, whose work you will have seen in films like Sideways and many others, 310 to Yuma, and many other films as well. And the intimacy of his cinematography, uh, Christie's direction, and especially to the sharpness and the, the acute observation of Christie's writing, I think is what really makes the film. Dakota and Sean will be here after the screening for a Q&A, so please stick around for that. I heard a couple of uh, little gasps there, so that's nice. <laughs> Uh, but I want to invite you to uh, join me in welcoming to the stage the writer and director of Daddy-O, making her feature film debut here, Christy Hall. Hello, hello. Wow. Uh, thank you for being here. This, this is my first feature, so to have you here, it's just so exciting to finally share it. Uh, it's very overwhelming, thank you. Um, I want to thank TIFF for having us. Thank you so much, it's such an honor and a, and a privilege. Um, I also need to thank my cast of two, <laughs> Dakota Johnson and Sean Penn. They not only believed in this script, but they believed in me. And they are truly the heartbeat of this film, and I'm so grateful. Uh, I'd also like to thank producers Emma tillinger Koskoff, Dakota Johnson, Roe Donnelly, all our friends at Rea Films and the Hercules Film Fund. Thank you so much. Um, this movie is my love letter to New York City, <laughs> specifically to that very irreverent, foul-mouthed, brash, and yet somehow sort of charming New York City ca cabbie, taxi driver. Um, this film is also a celebration of um, the power of human connection, especially in a time such as right now. We're forgetting what it means to just talk to each other. And we're very much losing the art of what it means to carry on a conversation with someone who doesn't see the world exactly the way that we do. Um, but I've had so many profound, lively conversations all over New York City and all over the world. And it's made me utterly convinced that even a very imperfect stranger can change your life. Lastly, this film flirts with that very fine line between drama and dark humor. 
So if anything tickles you while you're watching this movie, I promise it really is okay to laugh. Enjoy the film. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Norm Wilner. Don't applaud me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm Norm Wilner. I'm acting lead programmer for Canada and Industry Selects, and uh, Cameron very graciously allowed me to, to jump in and do this uh, due to a conflict. So I get to say, please welcome back Christy Hall. Please welcome back Christy Hall. Sorry, there's some confusion. Hello again. <laughs> working chair. Okay. And, um, yeah. and you can invite uh, the guests. Oh, wonderful. Dakota Johnson and Sean Penn, will you join me on this beautiful stage? So, hi, welcome back everybody. Um, and welcome back from the movie. I, I, like the dream state that we're, we're in when the movie is playing and everybody's just sucked in and absorbed. I, I kind of love that. But I wanted to start by asking about, um, there's a lot of dialogue in this film, but I wanted to ask about the silences, which seem pretty crucial to me in both characters' experiences in the, in the um, the, I mean, everybody, all the actors I've ever met have, have spoken about films, parts, characters being a journey. And this is a literal journey from JFK to Midtown uh, during which nothing happens and everything changes. So how, how, do you, how do you write that? You know, it can't just be she thinks, he pauses. And how do you direct it and how do, how do the two of you play it? I guess I can start. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's all very in intentional, you know, it's, um, I'm a playwright by trade, so uh, you really do, you build in what you think, what you hope might be the laughter, and you build in what you believe should be the silences, and I was just so lucky to work with masters of their craft, because, you know, without their skill set, this, this film doesn't work, you know, um, because we have to be willing to go on this ride and live with them. And, you know, they, they just deliver um, all of the nuances and the specificity uh, from the page to the screen in such an elegant, effortless way that um, it's just, it's remarkable. It, it's, it's all very intentional, uh, but they make it look absolutely organic and real in, in the most profound way. And can we talk about how you find those characters in those moments? Um, I guess we can start, just go down the line and start with Dakota. Uh, I mean, it was so, everything was on the page. It was really so, um, I think when something is so well written, it's, it, it makes sense. The pauses, the natural pauses make sense and the, the breath and then the, you know, when there's kind of a banter going, it all just, flows in a way that feels really natural so I don't it never felt you know like one of those uncomfortable uncomfortably long silences um also when you're in a car with a cab driver there's a lot of silences so it just felt very very real and and also I think th what they're talking about deserves a little bit of space at moments um because they're both experiencing what that journey is as well. Yeah, uh, Sean, you, I, I get to say Sean, uh, <laughs> been watching your work for decades, man. Um, there's, there are moments here where Clark goes away and he just goes and thinks inside himself for a bit. Um, and the, the layering of those moments, clearly that's his journey. He's figuring something out that we don't even get to be privy to she just happened to be there to, to connect, to facilitate it. Like, um, there's this affected toughness that he carries that doesn't make it to his eyes. Like you're, there's, a, there's a softness in the eyes that, like the close-ups can't help but bring this out. So are you, 
I mean, do you, again, how do you make that, how do you get there? How do you, how do you find the place that is hard and soft at the same time and, and still, like, you're actively listening but also just not present sometimes because he's dealing with his own stuff? I mean, is it just, like, is it a muscle that you can do now? I think I've, I've always thought, because especially because I've directed a couple of movies and mostly, I think mostly things that I've written, mm -hmm. you know, that as an actor you often get asked about, as an actor who's directing, you know, did it help that you had been an actor and so on. And actors finally have such different approaches, whether they come from the same school of acting or no school of acting. It still is very personalized and it's when you write that you feel very connected to the actor's performance. And with Christie's script, when I first read it, I just felt that not only did I not want to change a word, I, I understood exactly why when she says intentionality, everything that you just, just described was virtually written on, on the page in the description of what was going on with it. So it was not, the only interpretation involved really was which interpretation was going to lead her to what casting. And so she must have sensed that she wanted, so I think we were just hearing the same song once she'd written it. And, and, and the same was with Dakota where I just felt like one can work with an actor or an actress or whatever the politically correct term of a thespian who's anything is. Um, <clears throat> too much thinking for me. Um, but uh, it, even wonderful people will disappoint you in moments, and you'll disappoint them because somehow they, they felt a magic off the page or, or a possibility for moments. And in this case, every day, it was just so the opposite of that, where. I, and, and I think this also speaks to the integration of it and, and, and the whole team that Christy and, and Dakota as a producer and Roe, they, 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 they put together, it, 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 it's something that works or doesn't work based on the integration of everything. So, you know, the DP coming in and seeing the same song. And, and this was one of those rare movies where you just felt like everybody was singing the same song. Uh, Richard Linklater described it once as smelling the same movie which sounds weird until you think about it for a second. And it's that, it's like, it's, a, it's, an, it's another active sense um, that's at work. So this is gonna be an awkward question. When did you first smell this movie? When did, you, when did you know this was a film? When did you start the project and how did you know you wanted to do it? Uh, well, it started out as a, as a stage play, which I'm sure comes as no surprise. You know, most, most theater pieces are you know, five actors or less in one setting talking to each other. So started out as a stage play and um, I, uh, it landed in the lap of uh, Harry Langsfield, who's now my manager. And uh, I will quote him because he did say, you know, because I've always wanted to do film and television, but live theater is a very separate world. So it's really hard to, to find a bridge uh, between one and the other sometimes. So, um, I said, you know, I've always wanted to do film and television, but I, I don't quite know how to break through. And he said, you know, uh, Hollywood loves playwrights. So take this and turn it into a screenplay and let's see what happens. And uh, it started getting reads. This was early 2017. And um, the town really passed it around and read it. And it was very humbling, actually, how quickly it happened. Because by the end of that year, it, the, the script was number three on the blacklist. And, um, and it just invited me on a new path in my creative uh, journey. And I raised my hand to direct it. Um, I had raised my hand to direct other things that I had written, and I'd actually been told no. And so it really took, I'm gonna cry. Ro told me not to cry, so I will try to, I'm doing you my best. cry. <laughs> Let it, but it really, it really, it took, you know, uh, you know, this, this script landed on the, on the lap of Emma tillinger Koskoff, who she uh, produced The Irishman and The Joker. It landed in the lap of Dakota Johnson and Ro Donnelly, their, their production company, Tea Time. Dakota said, what do you think about us slipping this script to, to my good old friend, Sean Penn? And, and like what he's talking about, everyone hearing the same song, like I suddenly 
was surrounded by people who not only believed in the script, but they believed that I was the one to take the helm. And I wouldn't be sitting here if it was not for that trust. And I'm, I'm, just, so, I'm just so grateful. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, obviously the logical next question is toward Dakota. Um, uh, this, uh, speaking of intentionality, this is a role that kind of pushes against a couple of things uh, in, that are in your toolbox. I mean, you're, you're an incredibly animated presence, and this requires you to not move. Like, you're just, it's, so many shots are just her either kind of with her chin resting on the, as you get, as you grow more trusting of each other, you get physically closer, the space collapses. But we really only see your head and your hands for the most part, and you're very still because that's Until what... you see the nudes. Well. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, crap, this WGA, I guess, SAG stuff. We can't really talk about struck work. I hope you all understand, but you know, there is, there is a body of, there, is, there are films in your past which are designed. A body of work? Well, <laughs> as it were. Um, we talked about Ben and Kate before. Oh, crap, I shouldn't have said oh, that. This oh, wonderful God. sitcom she made 10 years ago. Anyway, that's my angle. But um, yeah, you're playing with your image as much as, as Sean is playing with his. And, and the script requires you to do that, really. But also, the two of you are kind of ideal for that sort of thing. Um, and is that what you responded to? And is like the opportunity to kind of push back against other, like the public perception or the popular version of yourself that's out there that doesn't you, that isn't you? I didn't. I didn't feel that. I I more felt like I was really interested in the sort of parallel experience of when in life, or as it, ha, what I've experienced in life is when you are like bumping up against something in yourself, it is very confined. It's not like uh, having a massive movement of experience. And um, I don't know, I guess I just found the the landscape of the, like the, the back seat to be similar to what it feels like to really go through something that is painful and growth is painful and heartache and, and it always feels very tight inside of you. And I think that doing this work and being like the gift of saying these words and having this conversation with this extraordinary person and extraordinary talent was, uh, um, it was like, like emotional chess in a way, you know? It was like, um, exploring the depths of a very, very small, you know, an inch wide and a mile deep. It was a very small space that had a lot of huge thoughts and feelings and circumstances inside of it. Um, so it felt very, very human, I think. And I, I love it. I love, I was so in love with it every day. Um, just being able to like, explore the humanness of these two people, the light and the dark and the dirty and the beautiful and, um, so I guess in terms, like, was it, I, I had just come off of a Marvel movie, so that was different. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not supposed to talk about this. Oh, right. Sorry. Okay. We're, we're just trying Shit. to make sure, <laughs> you know. That was just short for marvelous. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, but we can talk about solidarity for a moment, which is that me, a, a former union member journalist, is trying his best not to put you guys in a state where you'll be in trouble. I'll be fine. You'll be fine. But this is still something worth supporting. The, and we were talking backstage about the sharing of art being the most important thing you can do in support of art. So if you'd like to speak to that, by all means. That feels like a you question. Actually, it was a Christy question. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, I mean, look, we what we were talking about backstage. Oh yeah, no, we, um, look, we've been assured by, uh, by SAG that this is what solidarity looks like and we're just so proud to have our interim agreement so that we could be
be here together to support this this very small indie movie that we shot in 16 days. <laughs> Which was my next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're we're delighted to have you and the and the film. Um, and we can talk about marvelous movies next year. Um, but but yeah, 16 days. Uh, I'm assuming everyone's schedules are kind of always in flux. Anyway, you go with what you can get. But how? complicated was the shoot? I mean, was was it actually, was it like the way Stephen Knight shot Locke with Tom Hardy in a moving car on top of a bed? Or did you shoot, was there a green screen? Was there, was, how did you do that? Uh, because we had such a short amount of time um, and because, because the journey from JFK to Hell's Kitchen is so distinctive, anyone who has spent much time in New York, you know what that drive looks like. Um, once you leave JFK, it's kind of cement and industrial. And once you exit 495, it becomes more expansive and more bright. And then at, obviously, as you are starting to get closer to Manhattan, like I actually like that each stage is bringing us closer and closer to illumination, which I feel like is very, th you know, it's part of the thematics of the story that they, they start as strangers and more and more gets revealed. So I felt like the journey was another silent third character in this movie. And I really wanted to honor the specificity of that drive. Um, so the idea though of, of putting this beautiful <laughs> cast in, in a car and just having grip gear hanging off the side and cameras like, you know, our 16 days were shoved between Thanksgiving and the holidays of last year, so we didn't have a lot of wiggle room. So um, that's a really big tourist season, and then also the weather is unpredictable. So we had no idea if we would hit gridlock. Like we, there was just we couldn't reset easily, and um, continuity I think would have been a nightmare. So it just made sense. I mean, these were conversations that I had actively with, with Dakota and Roe and Emma of, okay, how do we do this well and responsibly? How do we soak the most out of this, these precious, the precious time that we have allotted? And so we really decided to put it um, on a soundstage. But uh, doing blue and green screen, uh, it would have been really expensive actually to apply all of those back grounds later. And then also, it wouldn't really give us the ability to really know actually what it was going to look like. We, we, we would have been unable to really create a world. And it would have all happened later. Um, and I just was worried that it would feel a little too inauthentic uh, for my taste. So we decided to utilize this brand new technology that is very uh, famously used by the Mandalorian. They have a full volume uh, stage. It's almost like a snow globe of LED panels that they I see a lot of people nodding their heads. They're like, oh, I know. We have um, one in Toronto. There, there you go. Exactly. So uh, that's the very bougie version of what I'm talking about. What we did was we, uh, we did get these panels, but um, they were movable. Um, they were high resolution, large format um, LED panels that we surrounded the cab with. And then on those LED panels, we projected the drive that we shot on an array car with nine cameras from JFK to Hell's Kitchen. What was really exciting about that is even on it, so everything interior in the cab that you just watched was done on a soundstage. Yeah. And it's exciting because it created this immersive world for the actors to respond to. Even when Sean was driving, he could see the road out ahead of him. And Dakota would look out the window and a car would whiz by and it allowed Fade and Papa Michael, our incredible DP, you know, he could also uh, add hard light on top of the soft light. Um, so if a car whizzed by, he could get a hit of red that would be from the tail lights. Like, we could really actually be extremely intentional about what you're seeing outside the windows. And not only that, the background and foreground are all filtering in through the camera at the same time. And we had these incredible anamorphic lenses that were detuned for more of a vintage look. So it actually looks real. It's not applied later. It's all happening all at the same time. And I think it looks gorgeous. And I hope it encourages other students and other storytellers and filmmakers to utilize this technology. Because if you have constraints of time and budget, it really is, it, it's incredible. Yeah, it's a new tool. Um, and to, to wrap, because we, I'm getting the signal, um, what was it like to do that? I mean, I don't think either of you have done that much extensive work on that level with effects. So how did it change your process? Did it did it bring you somehow closer as performers, being the only like present people in this whole space? Well, one one of the other things about it is that we we saw very little of the crew when we were working. We were surrounded by that, and if Christy had thoughts about a take or something, she'd sort of sneak between the panels. 
and these takes might go on for 10 minutes or whatever they were. And so there was a real feeling of privacy. And if there was ever a crew I would have wanted around, it was this crew. So to have your own bedroom <laughs> to close the door in and have a wonderful family outside is a nice thing. And so, yeah, and, and, and also, I, you know, I always felt that there's this thing that the audiences don't always know um, when they're being lied to, but they always know when they're being told the truth. And there's something in um, green screen that's still, in, as a technology seems, it, it, I feel it when I watch a film, and, and, and I like to avoid using it when, when I can. And, and this, it felt very in the movie to my eye, but also on the, on the set, it, it felt so present. It would be like, a, um, you know, simulators that the, you know, used in aviation or military uh, uh, exercises and so on. And, you know, very high resolution, really um, present feeling. A couple of times I was worried I was going to run over somebody in the crosswalk if I just decided to keep driving. <laughs> You know, they walk past you. Uh, Dakota, the experience for you? Yeah, I mean, it was it was great. It's a, everything Sean said, and and um, there were also times when the panels had to be shifted because of the camera angle, which made you feel like you weren't going down the road like this, but you were going down like sideways, in a, which really made me feel quite ill. <laughs> um, uh, but it, yes, it was a lovely experience. And, and also we had two cabs that we shot in. We had a full cab and then we had a cab that we had cut in half so we could fit cameras between the two, which then made it uh, slightly less intimate, um, and harder to hear each other. So we had, uh, little speakers that were connected to each other's microphones. And so Sean's voice was like coming up from my lap. <laughs> um, which was fun. <laughs> well, thanks for coming out. Thank you all for being the first Toronto audience to see this. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Dakota. Thank you, Sean. It was a pleasure. We'll see you at the next one, everybody.